All right, this morning uh, we find ourselves continuing our journey through Paul's letter to the Romans. This is our 10th week examining Paul's words as he makes a thorough case for the absolute need of every man and woman to get right with God. Now, one of the things about going through a book of the Bible is there can be what feels like a fair bit of repetition. Rep, repetition. <laughs> Particularly when a writer like Paul labors to make sure that the recipients of his letter really understand what he's saying. And so he restates and rephrases things a number of times. And that's okay, because this is God's Word. It's living and active. And no matter how often we examine it, there's always going to be things for us to learn and ways that the Holy Spirit pricks our hearts and impacts our lives. So I encourage you to prepare your hearts and minds for what God has in store for you today. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 11 to 16. Romans 2, 11 to 16, and I ask that if you're able, you would stand with me as we read God's Word. For God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, this morning we acknowledge how good and just and wonderful you are. Lord, even in the times where we don't understand it or it's hard to, to see and to reconcile with our experience, Lord, we know you've told us in your word that you are good and just. And so, Lord, this morning, help us to see that, to, to understand it, to be able to stand firm on that conviction on who you are and how you've revealed yourself to us. Lord, give us wisdom and understanding. Work in our hearts. Lord, you deliver your words to our hearts through your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So our text today is directly related to the passages that we've explored in the previous two messages. The main thing that Paul is communicating here is that God is an impartial judge, just as he states in verse 11. So we're going to start there. God is an impartial judge. I want you to think about the things that we've seen so far in this letter. In the first chapter, Paul really seems to be addressing the Gentiles, which is everyone who's not a Jew. And in the second chapter, his focus seems to have shifted to the religious person, namely Jews. Paul has been addressing their self-righteous deception and their attitude of religious and ethnic superiority. In chapter 1, while Paul was harshly addressing Gentiles, any good Jew would have heartily agreed with Paul's words. But Paul makes the point in chapter 2 that there's a disconnect happening somewhere for them. He talks about those who judge others yet practice the very same things that they judge. And then he even challenged them in verse 3, do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? And then he challenges how they abuse God's kindness instead of repenting. And in verse 5 he says, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself. And then in verses 6 to 10, Paul continues to build on this idea and he talks about how God judges us according to our deeds or our works which was the message last week, and he brings all of this back together again when he says in verse 9 and again in verse 10, the Jew first and also the Greek. Now Paul clearly cares about the recipients of this letter understanding what he meant. 
He didn't want confusion. He cared too much about God's glory and people's eternal souls to allow them to miss anything here. And so he endeavors to clarify, restate, and summarize and repeat. You can almost picture him speaking between these words, saying, please don't miss this. You need to understand this. How can I help you comprehend this? Lord, please give them understanding. Paul needed his Jewish kinsmen to know that they weren't safe because of their ethnicity, background, or religious affiliation. Their bloodline couldn't save them. Their clothing couldn't save them. Their temple rituals couldn't save them. Just like the Gentiles, the Jews were in desperate need of Christ. Why? Because they couldn't save themselves. They couldn't be righteous enough. The whole Old Testament reveals that again and again. And God shows no partiality. This means that God doesn't show favoritism in his judgment. He won't judge anyone differently when it comes to eternity because of their family, culture, last name, money, power, prestige, nationality, or anything else. John Piper said, he is not moved by irrelevant external appearances. He sees through them and goes to the heart of the matter and is not partial to appearance and circumstance. Nobody breaks the rules and gets away with it. No matter how powerful or clever or wealthy or networked, all are judged by the same measure. Now for the Jew, this would be a shocking and difficult message. There would understandably be some confusion. This essentially turns their entire worldview upside down. That's why we see Paul wrestle so much with the Jews throughout the New Testament. They trusted in their identity as God's chosen nation. They knew that the law was important. This idea of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, it was a foreign concept, one that seemed like blasphemy and foolishness. That's why we see in 1 Corinthians 1.23, Paul said, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to Gentiles. But for today, for us, this is actually an encouraging thing. Though, of course, there's a terrifying aspect as well. The terrifying thing is that I am going to stand before God one day and be judged. And I'll either spend eternity with Him in glory, or I'll suffer for eternity in damnation. And attending church won't save me, nor will anything else that I strive after. Nothing I obtain, no notoriety or fame, no wealth or power I accumulate, nothing is going to save me from this day of judgment. And so if you're trusting in any of those things to save you or to carry you through into eternity, your hope is misplaced. And you will hear, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And more terrifying words will never strike your ears. Now the encouraging part of this is that for those of us who have no wealth, power, or fame, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter at all. You could leave this earth with nothing but a cardboard box to your name and the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezoses of this world have no edge on you whatsoever. All the treasures and the power that they've accumulated are absolutely worthless. That's one of the reasons that Jesus and Paul both speak of storing up treasures in heaven and not living for the things of this world. They don't matter. God won't judge your eternal destination and security based upon how many followers you have on social media, the color of your skin, your gender, or anything else. Now that's incredible news. It's totally contrary to how so many of the decisions and the judgments of this world work. But God isn't like that. 
He isn't like us. He judges perfectly, and a perfect judge will render judgment impartially. Now, this is great news. And it's something that should cause us to ask, just as people would have in Paul's day, if God is impartial, and it's not about who I am or what I have, then what is judgment based upon? Well, even though Paul's written about this a number of different times already in chapters 1 and 2, it's where he goes again now. So look at verses 12 and 13. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. The law of God. There's a standard. There's something that we can be judged against. You've probably heard it said a number of times, especially if you've been around church, that God's law is like a schoolmaster or a teacher or a mirror. It's the standard that we can use to base and judge morality. Now, last week we looked at God judging according to our works. Well, it's the law of God that our works get judged against. And this is actually a beautiful thing because it's not arbitrary. It's not mysterious and hidden. God gave us the law so that we could have a clear picture and standard. But Paul uses some wording here in verses 12 to 15 that can really be confusing for people as he talks about judgment being based upon the law. And so I want to walk through the concepts here and not get bogged down into all the different areas we could go, but just hopefully bring some clarity. Verse 13 of our text says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, I touched on this concept last week, and for the sake of time, we're not going to get into that again today because we'll be dealing with this issue extensively many times in the book of Romans. I think understanding this ties in with verse 16, that on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. God judges the heart. We looked at a bunch of verses last week that highlight that. Now, God judges the actions for sure, and he sees the motives behind the actions. He knows all the secret and hidden thoughts and desires. He knows our true characters. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. And in it all, he judges perfectly because he's perfect and his knowledge and his understanding are perfect. So for today, I just want to make sure that you know that salvation isn't because of our works or any righteousness that we can muster up in ourselves. We'll deal with this significantly in chapter 3 where Paul says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Paul's just starting to build this argument. He's trying to address the Jewish belief system and tear down what they're trusting in. Now let's keep that all in mind as we head back to this idea of the law. Paul seems to break it up into two different areas of focus and application, so that's what we're going to examine. Number one, God's law in text. God clearly communicated his law to his people first orally and then written. Now in Paul's day, the recipients of God's law, of God's law would have primarily been the Jew. God gave them the law, he interacted with them, and his law for many generations. There was a deep understanding of and appreciation for the law. Of course, not always. 
In our day, we would think of this written law as the Bible, God's Word, where He's given instructions, commands, and standards of all sorts and types. Now, Paul says, all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. He's saying, look, God gave you His commandments. If you break them, you're guilty. I think that's a pretty simple thing to understand, right? Like, if I tell one of my little ones not to run out onto the street, and they do, what happened? Well, they disobeyed Dad's instructions, They violated dad's law. And it matters, and there's going to be some kind of consequence. I think without digressing into all sorts of discussions and what the law is and how it applies, we understand the basic argument that Paul is making here. God gave laws as he fully has the right to do as the creator and the Lord of the universe. And we, as His created and finite beings, are expected to obey His laws. If we don't, there's consequences. And these consequences range from self-consequences from our actions, like getting hit by a car when we run out into the street, to different types of discipline, to what the Bible tells us about sin equaling death. And this is something that we've covered a lot so far in this series, so we're not going to dwell there right now. Again, this seems pretty straightforward. But what if you're thinking about this idea of the law being the standard that we're judged against and how some people don't have the law? That's some good thinking. And it's not a new thought. Paul addresses this in our text. He says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. Now this seems a little bit more complicated, doesn't it? And if we really evaluate our own feelings and judgments, it seems unfair, unloving, and unacceptable. We typically, I think, can accept the idea of someone being judged because they've broken a clear law. But what about someone being punished for violating something that they didn't know existed? Could you imagine moving to a new place and you're just going about your day normally and a bunch of police officers show up. They arrest you, throw you in jail, and the judge hands down the penalty of death. All of it because you broke some kind of law that you never heard of. One that wasn't even written into the law books. I mean, that sounds absolutely absurd, doesn't it? That doesn't sound like justice. Well, this is kind of the case that Paul's dealing with in this context. The Jews have the written law and the Gentiles don't. Most Gentiles are hearing about Jesus for the first time. Many most would be hearing about the one true God, Lord and Creator, for the first time. How can it possibly be fair for God to judge them according to His law? Well, this brings us to the second area of focus and application regarding God's law. Number two, God's law on the heart. Look at verses 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. God's law is, in essence, written on the hearts of mankind. And this answers a serious question that many people ask. It goes against a serious accusation accusation that many people direct toward God. I have not slept much in the last two nights, I'm sorry. (laughs) Perhaps you've heard or even asked a question like, 
What about the person in a remote village in the jungle? If God is good, loving, and just, he couldn't possibly hold them accountable to his law. Here, Paul is addressing this very issue. He says, there are Gentiles who, having no law, still do things that the law requires. Their own lives and actions are evidence that God's law is written on their hearts. And their own conflicting thoughts reveal their conscience and God's law. They condemn themselves because they fight against what God has instilled in them. And now we're going back to many of the things that Paul said in chapter 1. Look at Romans 1, 19-22. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools." Now, God has clearly revealed himself, but in their unrighteousness, they've suppressed the truth. They've exchanged the glory and the truth of God for a lie. Verse 28 says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Piper said the point of it all is to stress that every human being is guilty before God because everyone suppresses the truth and none lives up to even the demands of his own conscience, let alone all the demands of God known to him. MacArthur said without knowing the written law of God, people in pagan society generally value and attempt to practice its most basic tenets. This is normal for cultures instinctively to value justice, honesty, compassion, and goodness toward others, reflecting the divine law written in the hearts. For Paul, all of this keeps coming back to the fact that God is an impartial judge. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you have the written law of God in front of you or if you've never heard God's law before. Piper said, what God's impartiality means is that he judges not on the assumption that we all have access to the same amount of truth, but that we all have the truth we need to be held accountable and that we will be judged by our response to what we do have, not what we don't have. God has revealed himself significantly in creation. And part of that creation is the implanting of his law on the hearts of the people that he's created. He's made us with consciences that point us to him, draw us to him, and lead us to live according to his law. But in our sin and unrighteousness, we distort those very elements of God's law and we suppress the truth about who he is, who we are, and our great need for him. So we are without excuse. There's a lot of things being said here. And some of these things are difficult for us to wrestle through, particularly if we start thinking about people that we care about or the unreached people groups throughout the world. And so I want you to remember that we're talking about judgment here, not salvation there's still great hope to consider. And because God has given us here his word, we have the opportunity to come to know of him and then to know him and his salvation. We have the opportunity to share God's word. This precious gift to share God's word with others, to preach and to evangelize, to go throughout the ends of the earth proclaiming the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And we can trust that in such endeavors, God will work in people's hearts to bring them to saving faith in Him. And for those who are unreached, those who have never heard the gospel message, who have never heard of Jesus, we should have a burden for them and a deep desire to reach them with the good news. In the meantime, we can trust that God has revealed himself to them in his creation, that he's written his law on their hearts, and that he is working to bring all those who are his to him. Perhaps through dreams and visions, perhaps through his general revelation and creation, and perhaps even through some of us who are here right now, who may have the privilege to go and suffer in the remote and unknown places so that those people could hear the message of Christ. Romans 10, 15 says, quoting Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Well, I begin to wrap things up for today. I want to venture back to the idea of God writing His law in our hearts because I think there's many more areas of life that get impacted beyond just judgment and overseas missions. This principle speaks toward a great deal of life. It gives robust weight to things like moral standards and absolute truth. Not everything is subjective or relative. There are truths and moral standards echoed throughout creation, including being stamped upon our hearts. It impacts the attitude that I have toward evangelism. It allows me to understand that every person I witness to actually has some element of God's law written on their heart. They have a conscience predisposed to the things of God. Their main problem isn't a lack of knowledge. It's truth being suppressed in unrighteousness. They need the gospel. They need prayer. And I can have confidence to witness to them while I trust God to work in their heart. It impacts how we view ourselves. Do I believe that I'm carefully crafted by a creator? Do I understand that his law is written on my heart? Do I understand the intrinsic value that I have as such a created being? Am I aware of the war that's waging within myself, the battle of my flesh to suppress the truth? This impacts things like marriage, parenting, and other relationships. It challenges how we view other people. Do we view others as individual, unique human beings with emotions and personalities created in the image of God with the law of God written upon their heart? There's a lot of challenges here for us, far more than what I've had the opportunity to highlight today. So we're looking at a confusing passage, trying to get, not get lost in all the ways we could go. And where does this leave us? One, we need to know that God is an impartial judge with all of the terror and rejoicing that comes along with that. Class and status mean nothing to him. He judges the secret things of the heart. Number two, God judges people according to his law. Three, God has given his written law. Four, God has written his law on our hearts. Five, this law of God upon our hearts has many implications and applications. Six, God is just and not one single person will receive unfair judgment because God has clearly revealed himself. And seven, We've been called to be the hands, feet, and mouthpieces of God to this world. We have the opportunity 
and the call to go out into this world and to declare the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that many may come to know him. Dear people, God is just and he is good. We need to be careful not to try and establish ourselves as judge over him. Critiquing his goodness, elevating ourselves as if we would judge more equitably and justly. You've probably heard it said, maybe said it yourself, I could never judge like that. If he was actually good, he would do it differently because I'm pretty good and I would do it differently. It's self-deception. It's a lie. None of us are capable of perfect judgment. We need to remember the character of God and trust him to do what is right, even if, or especially if, we don't really understand. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. He is higher than us. Houston Baptist Church, let us be a people prepared for Judgment Day, trusting in Christ alone for our salvation. Let us be a people who are passionate about evangelism and sharing the beauty of the glory of the gospel of Christ with our lost and dying world. Yes, abroad, yes to the remote unknown places, but here in Houston too. There's thousands of people in this community who don't know Jesus. Let us be a people who treat others with dignity and respect because we know that they're made in the image of God and have God's law written on their heart. And let us be a people of praise as we worship our God for who He is and we trust in His perfect judgments. Let's pray. Lord, You are good. You're great and greatly to be praised. Lord, You are deserving of all honor and glory. So Lord, we thank You for Your goodness, Your faithfulness, Your love. I thank you that you are just and we can put our faith in you. We can trust you when it seems like you're making decisions that we can't reconcile with love and, and justice and mercy and, and grace. Give us eyes to see that we would understand who you are, that your ways are higher than our ways, that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, that we are finite, we are limited and we're self-deceived. But God, you are perfect. Lord, teach us this morning what it really means that you are perfect. What it looks like for us to walk in that and trust in that, to have confidence and assurance in who you are, in what you've said, in what you've done and will continue to do. Lord, so that we can go out and we can be bold and we can live in truth and we can walk in your spirit, in the power that you give to us. Lord, cleanse us as your people. Teach us, equip us. Lord, thank you that you do all these things, that you're faithful to continue to do them, that when we slip up, when we fall down, you are there with new mercies each day, with abundant grace. Oh, Lord, it's beyond our comprehension. Thank you. Be with us this day, Lord. Give us hearts of worship for you. Let us leave this place focused on you and willing to be your hands and your feet, to be your ambassadors who boldly proclaim the gospel that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for your great faithfulness. Be with us this day, we pray. Amen.